Hello everyone, welcome to lesson 19 on assessment. This is part one of a two-part series on assessment. So we are going to uh, jump right in looking at assessing student progress. Uh, of course, there's something to do for collaborate time. So to get us thinking about assessment, be sure that you are doing the self test, which is um, on testing page three from the Popham reading under the re on the reading list for uh, this is uh, lesson 19. So if you look, I believe it's on Blackboard. So go to that to go to the reading list, go to the Popham reading and then answer his question. We're going to focus on one, four, six, and eight, but you're welcome to do the whole test. It's kind of an interesting a little bit of a self test on what you feel um, and know about assessment. So be ready to jump into that in collaborate time. Okay, so what was assessment and evaluation in the olden days? So in the olden days, uh, assessment evaluation was probably a lot of rote learning, a lot of rote writing on exams, lots of tests, lots of standardized tests. Unfortunately, some of those things are still here in the 21st century, but hopefully you are starting to see a little bit more variety around assessment and evaluation. So today, hopefully you're seeing some differentiation for different students. Hopefully you're seeing, you're probably still seeing some tests and, and paper um, worksheets, things like that. You're probably starting to see a little bit more group work. So group work here where, um, you know, the, the, the students are working, are working together. Uh, there's maybe a little bit of peer and self-assessment going on and it's a little bit a little bit more collaborative hopefully between the student and the and the teacher okay so when we talk about assessment and evaluation there there's lots of terms there's lots of terminology around assessment and evaluation so we're going to kind of un unpack that a little bit today so basically these are assessment forms you have the diagnostic assessment which is basically what you do before you start a unit um a year some you, before you start some kind of uh content segment is you to try to figure out where where are the students at so if you are starting a math unit and you think the kids are here but they're actually here then where do you want to start? Here. You don't want to start way down here. The kids will be bored and you'll have classroom management issues. So that's what you do before you jump into a unit or your or really or your year to find out where your kids are at. Uh, formative assessment, or I like to call formative assessment actual assessment. This is um, this is what you're doing when uh, this takes place during instruction. So this is feedback um, about the activities that you're doing. This is where you're trying to figure out if the students are actually learning what you want them to learn. And summative assessment, I call evaluation. So when you hear me say assessment and evaluation, I'm, I like, that's how I like to define them. So summative assessment is, is basically that evaluation form. It's that end of, it's, the, it takes place after the instruction. It's what will be uh, used for report card marks. It usually goes towards the, the student's grade. It's some kind of written test, a quiz, a project, that kind of a thing. And it's usually something that students feel is done to them. It's the get test is given to them. Whereas assessment is, um, is more uh, so the assess this assessment here is more about observation it's more about and during class you go around and you you talk to the kids and you ask them you know what's what do you understand what don't you understand and so you're assessing where their learning is at in order to help them learn what you want them to learn okay so those are those are some terms that uh, might help you as we go through okay so basically we have to look at why why do we assess and evaluate? Basically, we assess 
No, so I'm going to learn use this term here, assess as formative assessment. So, so what we do, kind of what we do in class, oh boy, I need that pencil. Kind of what we do in class all the time and evaluate is that summative part. So that's the end, you know, your traditional tests and things like that. Okay, so when I say assess here, I'm talking about formative assessment. So basically, uh, we assess all the time as teachers. It's just kind of what we do. We're always constantly going, are they figuring it out? Am I getting deer in the headlights look? Like, do, are they just confused? If they are, then what do I do? So that's that's a formative assessment. Okay, so basically to assess is, it's a component of good teaching. We need to be assessing whether the students are learning what we want them to learn all the time or else we're not really doing um, we're not really doing our job. It's our opportunity to discover if the if the if the students understand. Okay, so that's it's kind of what we need what we need to be doing. So basically, the second point is we need this information to improve the learning process and to monitor students' progress. So if we if we go, yeah, actually these kids are really understanding all of these concepts that I am introducing to them, then what you do is then you go to the next level and you keep pushing, you keep scaffolding up, you keep moving their zone of proximal development and you, you keep progressing that way. Okay, you want to diagnose uh, the student's strengths and weaknesses. So you need to, again, know um, which students are really strong in one area and which students are weak and then how can you help them to progress in the manner that they should. And assessment, you want to determine instructional effectiveness and direction. Basically, it's your chance to, to go, uh, you know, actually, the way that I introduced this concept, the students were very confused. So I have to go back. I have to reflect. Remember, reflect a practitioner. I have to reflect, and then I have to try it again. So it's actually a way for you to see whether what you're doing as a teacher is actually effective at all. Okay, now evaluation, basically uh, you need to have evidence of learning. Unfortunately, we are, uh, we are public education, thus we get funds from the government. And so uh, there's a lot of money that comes into education. So there's, there's this sense of accountability that we need to have some sort of accountability for the funds that come in. So that unfortunately has equated to a report card with grades where all the kids are graded and they're compared to each other. There's, we could we could have a good debate about that whole system, but right now it's a little bit of accountability for the student that they are doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. And for us as teachers that we are teaching them and, and figuring out where they, if they've actually learned what we wanted them to learn. And ultimately we have to have something to put on that report card. Uh, you can have as many philosophical arguments with your principal as you want about uh, the state of evaluation in 21st century education. But ultimately, as of right now, you need to have something to put on that report card. Okay, so assessment terminology. So let's have a look at all, again, there's a lot of terminology out there. So uh, when I say assessment, again, I like to think of that as assessment and formative assessment are the same thing. You will also see assessment for learning. These are all the same, basically the same thing. You will see informal assessment. You will see self-assessment. You'll see, see authentic assessment, clinical assessment, subjective and diagnostic assessment. Sometimes gets looped into um, just straight up assessment uh, terminology. It will kind of depend on if you're looking at academic articles, it will depend on the year because some of these terms are definitely uh, like assessment for learning. That was kind of really popular in like 2000 to 2010. Any article that talked about assessment talked about assessment for learning. You will now probably in the in the most recent articles you will you will see formative assessment. So it depends on when the article that you're reading was written. Okay, 
Assessment examples. So let's have a look at assessment examples. So this is where you are just trying to figure out if the students have actually learned what you wanted them to learn. So there's two ways. Two ways to do it, teacher focused and student focused. So basically teacher focused is you're just observing. Again, you're walking around your classroom, you're looking at the student's work, you're looking at their faces, their body language, their eyes. If they're all kind of going, you probably are going, okay, they're confused. Okay, so observation. You just interact with the students. You just simply ask them questions. Again, you read body language. And I like to have checklists. I like to have things like, okay, on um, Monday, they did their morning work. Boom. They did their reading station. Boom. Oh, they weren't so hot. They just didn't really understand the math that day. They did pretty good in writing. And uh, yeah. So you did there. They actually, they did, they did pretty well. So again, it's a quick way for you to just see where maybe the child's strengths are and where their weaknesses are. And that took, you know, that takes you half a second to fill in. But at the end of the day, you actually have a pretty good idea of where that child is at versus going, what did they do? Um, you know, it's a busy day. You, you, gotta, you do a lot in a day. In, in school and so this just helps you keep organized. From a student point of view to for to see whether they're understanding, uh, they can they can be journaling. They can do video recordings. Yeah, I totally got this. This is the math concept that I learned today. Boom, here's an example, that kind of thing. They can take pictures. Kids have phones nowadays. Uh, upper elementary kids have phones. Junior high, senior high kids have phones. Get them to take some pictures of their work. Um, you can do surveys, okay. Did everybody get the concept? Thumbs up, mas o menos, not so good. And yeah, no, no, totally didn't get it. You can give them exit cards as they go out. Tell me if, uh, tell me one thing about that you learned today or tell me what, uh, what you know about this particular subject. And those exit cards or exit slips are actually really <laughs> revealing. Uh, you can learn a lot about if students' understanding of the content through student teacher conferences, a one-on-one, -on -one, or peer and self-assessment. Kids are usually pretty brutally honest about their own effort and their own understanding. So usually, it depends how you set it up, they have to feel like they're safe, remember? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if they feel that they're safe and that they belong, then they will assess uh, themselves and peers in an appropriate manner. You can do small group interviews. You and two or three students is usually less intimidating than try, you know talking in front of a whole class. They can do some group projects and they can have a portfolio where they put in examples of their work that shows us that shows understanding. It might not necessarily be a test, but it might just show understanding. And again, this is that allows the teacher to see where the students are in their learning. Okay, so that's assessment. Evaluation terminology. So evaluation terminology is again that uh, that that summative assessment. So that that thing that's sort of done at the end of learning. So here we go with some evaluation terminology. We have assessment of learning. Remember back here, I'm just gonna click back. Oops, sorry, get rid of my pencil. Uh, here it was assessment for learning. Now, again, this is like the 2000s, we have assessment of learning. We have just straight up evaluation. We have formal assessment, we have formal evaluation, we have marking, grade, report card, we have something that's usually seen as something that is done to the students. And we have ways of evaluating, we have criterion reference, which is based on um, assessment comparing to a criteria or comparing to a rubric. So you could have all of the students could receive an A, so that's criterion based against a criteria, or you can have norm referenced or bell curved. And this is where you compare the real life students in your class or across a province and only a few can get an A and the most, it's this, it's this kind of a, oh, yep, yeah, it's this kind of a curve. That only a few get an A, the bulk will get like C plus B in there, and then a few will get Ds and Fs. If you are doing norm referenced, somebody has to get Ds and Fs, and somebody has to get an A. 
And so you have to have a large pool of students for that to really be effective. If you, we used to do this here at Medicine Heart College when there was only a pool of about 25 students. And so students were being separated by like a hundredth of a point between an A minus and a B plus. And then they may, maybe there don't, there'd be a percentage difference between a B plus and a C plus. It was nasty uh, because it was just too small of a, so, a pool size. But when you have 300 or 600 or 800, that bell curve will actually works out pretty well and is actually pretty accurate. Okay, so evaluation examples. So here we go. We have tests, we have multiple choice and written, we have worksheets, we have quiz, planned, and pop quizzes. Don't we all love pop quizzes? Yeah, they're not stressful or anything. Um, they could do essays, they can have homework checks, they can do projects and journals, they can do in-class presentations, they can do portfolios, they can do research papers, peer self and teacher evaluation, performance tests where they actually, maybe uh, you're teaching a music class and they actually perform or you're teaching an ELA class, English language arts class, and they actually are, you know, uh, uh, presenting some of their work, something like that, and you can do standardized tests for evaluation. Okay, so you guys have all been students for uh, probably a fairly long time in your life, so you probably have some memories of assessment and evaluation. So in Collaborate, what we're going to do is I want you to share what you remember about assessment or values and strategies in elementary or in secondary classes. You can even put in post-secondary classes if you have lots of experience of post-secondary. And I want you to share an emotion that you remember around assessment and evaluation. So what is what is the emotion that you connect when I start talking about uh, e-portfolios and standardized tests and multiple choice tests and peer evaluations? What's the emotion? So we're going to talk about that in Collaborate. So jot a few things, jot a couple things down. Okay, what assessments and evaluation are not. This is what we don't want them to be. We don't want them to be just about grade, about tests. We don't want it to be just about the grade book. We don't want it to be separate from curriculum. We don't want it to be separate from instruction. We don't want it to be about finding weaknesses and we don't want it to just be for the teacher. Okay, that's not what we want it for. What we want it for, what we want assessment and evaluation is when assessment is seen as learning for students as well as teachers, then it becomes most informative and worthwhile for both alike. So when, when we start to think of assessment and evaluation as something that we just you know do at the end of a unit or we just kind of do because we have to because we have to have report card grades, then it's not very worthwhile. What we want is assessment and evaluation to be woven into what we naturally do as teachers all the time and that it it's actually informative and worthwhile for our students um, to actually learn something from. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting, again, I want you to, uh, to think about this, talking to students about assessment and evaluation. So I think oftentimes, like, this might be a foreign concept to you that, you that you would talk to your teachers about assessment and evaluation and that they would talk to you. It's basically just, here are the assignments, do the assignments, hand them in, and here's the test, do the test, hand it in, and you're done. But what should students know about their teacher's assessment and evaluation plans? I think that students need to know that these are fair assessments and evaluations, that they are linked to curricular objectives, that there's a purpose for these assessments and evaluations, which is not just about the report card, but it's actually about trying to figure out where the student is at and taking them down the path of learning, okay? Our students should know what assessment types will be used for what learning. So if you, if you really want to have a sense that they have the overall idea of something, then you would want to, you would want to link that with like an e-portfolio or a performance-based 
uh, assessment or evaluation. If you want them to know really specific content or really specific um, terminology, then a multiple choice might be uh, really actually quite revealing if that's. But I think our students need to know that we have really purposefully looked at what we're trying to teach you, how we're trying to teach it to you, and then how are we actually going to assess. And there's not this huge chasm in between the two that how what we've been how we've been teaching you is so different than from how we're assessing okay so i think that's important and um so who remembers getting a mark in it was usually like in music or phys ed or art or something like that and you're like i have no idea where that mark came from but they were usually okay, like they were usually pretty high. So I'm just gonna go with it. Okay, I I must admit, I taught some um, music in uh, when I first started teaching. I had uh, several music classes. And as a, as a first year teacher, it's like, wow, there's so many things going on. That basically my assessment, and I hate to even say this, my assessment was basically, did the kids show up? Was the kid a nice kid? Did they try? If they did those things, I basically gave them a, a good grade. My assessment was a hot mess. And, uh, but, but we have, we have the responsibility to not let that go on for many years. That we really need, our, our students need to be confident that we know what we're trying, what the, what we're trying to teach them and then the appropriate way to assess. That was not my most stellar moment, but it was a moment anyways uh, around my assessment strategies. I, 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 did, I did clean that up. It, it did get better. Okay, and the second point. Uh, involve students as much as possible in why they are being assessed or evaluated in a particular way. So the more that they are engaged in the actual assessment or evaluation process, the more they're going to buy in. So for example, if you can, instead of handing the students a pre-made rubric, if you could create the rubric together, their, their buy-in is huge. And you might say, well, they won't come up with the right things. They do amazingly come up with a lot of the right things that you want them to come up with. And you have to, trust in them that they will come up and there might be a few things that you go I must have this in the rubric and then you let them decide the rest and I think you'll be amazed at maybe not in like K grade one grade two but three four five six definitely junior high definitely high school they know the gig they know the gig by then okay so this is one of my favorite quotes of all times on assessment and, evalu and, and evaluation. He wrote, not everything, this is an art, he's an arts um, educator, not everything that matters can be measured and not everything that is measured matters. Isn't that brilliant? So for example, I'll go back to my early years of teaching music. And um, so in music, I could give them a worksheet on theory and they could write out all the notes for me and but I don't really actually have a clue I didn't have a clue if they had any emotional connection to the music which is ultimately what I wanted but my assessment was so different than what my ultimate goals were my ultimate goals were that I wanted them to have this emotional connection to the music but yet I tested them on theory and can you and can you identify this note as an F or an A or a C or a quarter note or a half note? And so there was there was this huge disjunct again between what I what I wanted them to learn and how I assessed their learning. Again, we will talk a little bit more about this concept when we talk about standardized test because uh, it, I think it's so true around uh, the the issues that we are now facing with standardized tests is that not everything that matters can be measured 
it's kind of like that emotional connection to the music. How can I actually measure that? And not everything that is measured matters. We can pump out lots of numbers out of standardized tests, but it maybe doesn't matter. That's another rant for another day. Okay, but keep that in mind when you're thinking about assessment and evaluation. Okay, here we go. Issues, issues with assessment and evaluation. Oftentimes, um, oftentimes, assessment and evaluation can become a deterrent rather than a motivator. So kids get stressed out, they're getting pressured from home, they're anxious, and it, it actually becomes a real deterrent, uh, especially around high stakes tests, like standardized tests, uh, provincial, provincial achievement tests, end of the year tests, those kind of things. On uh, the next one, teacher and students become focused on the grade. Right, they become focused on the grade. Um, unfortunately, here at MHC, our second years have to apply to get into third year into the MRU program. And unfortunately, it is straight up GPA. We, we dislike it um, as a faculty, but that is, um, that is sort of the mandate. And so they are focused on grades and legitimately so, but it, it hurts our soul a little bit because they're sometimes missing out on really on learning opportunities because their goal is to get high grades in order to get into the program. So we end up focusing um, on the grade. My daughter, uh, when she was in school, actually both my daughters, when they were in school, they were in a grade five, six split class. And so grade six, they had provincial PATs. Both my daughters spent two years prepping for the PATs, which basically had very, very little effect to no effect on their individual education and very little effect on overall education. But they got focused on doing well in those in those tests. Okay, third one, hard to create performance, hard to create performance criteria. It is really hard to create a really good rubric, a really good test, a really good scoring method um, to get all levels of understanding of the blooms. Remember the blooms, remembering all the way up to creating. It's hard. These are hard things to create uh, that will actually give you a really unbiased, uh, really in-depth kind of look. Um, then, okay, so the next one. There's a bias to a particular learner or learning style. So we, we, we come in with the bias. I don't think we can deny that we come in with the bias. And maybe we're biased to a particular learner, you know, that kid that we just, you know, you just kind of get along with some kids and other kids are just harder to, to connect with. And so um, when we mark those exams or we mark those, those uh, e-portfolios, those kids that we connect with, we have to be really careful that they don't just always get higher grades. When I mark your uh, online stuff, I cover. I try to cover up your names on my screen so that I can mark with an unbiased view. Again, it's just it, it's 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 part of who we are as human beings. We we come in with the, with that bias. Okay. Sometimes we, there's a misinterpretation of motivation or lack of motivation in particular students. And so then that ends up creeping into how we assess and evaluate them. So maybe um, there's a child going through some trauma at their home and they appear to not really care about the assignment or handing stuff in or the test. And we interpret that as they aren't smart enough or they just don't care when actually they're concerned that maybe mom's not going to be home when they get home. Okay. So again, it's hard to, it's hard to create these unbiased assessment and evaluation tools. Okay. Uh, next one, it stifles the ability to go deep with a subject. So unfortunately, when we have to be uh, focusing on potentially studying for PATs or for big exams, we have to do so much surface content that we don't have time to go deep. 
and that's where real learning happens we know is when we can go deep but unfortunately the way that it's set up is we have to go so surface that we can't we can't we don't have time to go deep i uh, i was a faculty advisor for a student in calgary and she was teaching grade 12 social studies uh, so social 30 and the partner teacher had every single day absolutely marked out there was no deviation from the day so on um you know november 1st to 5th they did democracy and that was it so it didn't matter if the kids were super interested or wanted to do a debate or wanted to do more work they moved on to fascism on monday because that's all the time they had for democracy and there's nothing i'm not faulting the teacher that's just the way that it there's just so much content in the curriculum to get through that that's what the teacher had to do Okay, so process versus standard. So here we go. Do you judge how will the child end, how well the child did individually with the process, or do you grade them again against a standard? So if a they all get the same answer but they go a different way, how do you assess it if you want them to all get to a certain standard? So is it about the journey? Is it about and it links into the next one. Is it about the journey? The, the journey that the kids take and the learning that they they end up gaining or is it only about the end product is it only about what they can do on the test or the end the end project okay when does skill actually matter when does it actually matter if the student can multiply numbers correctly when does it matter if they can actually um, sink a hoop. Yeah, and it's not, and it's, it's not just about trying anymore. They actually have to be able to sink the hoop. So basically, we all want our neurosurgeons who are working on our heads to come out skilled. Right? Uh, my doctoral uh, faculty advisor used to comment that he didn't really care about the bedside manner of his, of his surgeon. He just wanted to know that he or she was actually had some skills. So when does actually skill matter over trying? Justify group marks. This is a big one. This is a really interesting one. How can we ever justify giving a group mark when we all know what happens in groups? Somebody does all the work, somebody doesn't do any of the work, somebody just takes over and gets bossy and the rest of the group ends up disliking them. Like we all know group dynamics. So how can you, um, if you want to collaborate, how can you justify group marks? Okay, if there are others, we're going to have a bit of a go with these and collaborate as well, because I'm sure you have a, some opinions. So have some opinions on these. And if you have others that you want to add onto this list, we will chat about it in Collaborate. Okay, this is what I want you to think about for Collaborate. We have a few, a few things to, to be pondering. So if you could individually choose your evaluation method for this class, for EDTS 321, what would you choose to show your understanding of the material on all of Bloom's levels? Okay, so not just remembering, not just uh, pounding out terms, but all the way down to create. Okay, so I want you to think about that. If you were me and you got to choose how to assess this class, how would you assess it? And how do your evaluation plans differ from one another and then from mine? So we're going to have a bit of a go with this and hopefully we'll get lots of different cool ways to, um, to think about assessment and evaluation in this particular course. Okay, this is kind of the nitty gritty of, this kind of the nitty gritty of, of evaluation. So when you're out there as a first year teacher and you're going, oh my goodness, I have to, Put something on these i have to put something on these uh report card uh report cards and i don't really know what that looks like so how many evaluations per reporting period so this is how many grades per report card term should you have for each subject does it depend on the subject or the grade and um base and and okay so let's answer those questions how many grades per report card should you have for each subject Generally, I would have three to six grades per subject per report card. 
Does it depend on the subject or grade? Yes, absolutely. So math, ELA, science, social, you may have more for things like phys ed, music, art, uh, those those uh, those more elective type subjects, I would maybe have uh, two to three grades per subject for per term. And the term is like September to November, November to January, February to April, May to June kind of thing in there. So you don't need 55 grades per term. But you need, again, it's this loop back to, they need to be really authentic and assessments and evaluations, and they need to really connect to how and what you have actually been looking on, um, teaching in your class, right? And you wanna base your assessment and evaluations on the skills listed in the Alberta Program of Studies. Again, you wanna keep coming back to that Alberta Program of Studies, because that's your core. Okay. This is what I want you to think about in Collaborate. We're going to have a little bit of a go, a little bit of a go with this. So basically, what would you do if you're a first year teacher? How would you uh, break down your evaluation? Would you use tests? Would you use quizzes? Would you use worksheets? Would you use projects? Would you have a homework grade? Would you have an in-class work grade? Would you have a grade for growth or a grade for effort? Does it matter if it's grade four? Whoa, grade eight, grade 12, right? So these are questions that I want you to think about and be ready to ponder in Collaborate. And what would your breakdown be? What would your actual percentage be? So would it be 100% uh, tests? <laughs> Or would it be 0% tests? So I want you to actually put some numbers in here. 20% uh, worksheets and 80% effort. Again, think about if it was grade 4 language arts, if it's grade 8 math, if it's grade 12, that's cool. I have not done that before. Let's see, can I get it back? Wow, that was fun. Um, or if it's grade 12 phys ed. Okay, so again, let this stir, let this spin around in your head and be ready to put some actual real numbers down here in Collaborate time. Okay, good. That's our first romp through this section of assessment and we'll finish it up in the next one, um, the next part B for assessment. All right, take care everybody.